crisis in Syria. Each minute we're sitting here, there's someone is killed, injured, displaced, or detained. We need to think about those people. We will continue to argue about Western intervention. I will disagree with you, you will disagree with me. But what we should really think about at this moment, how can we help the people there? They're desperate. And they're desperate for the smallest thing, trust me. When I spoke, to, when, I, when I had had lots of chats with the young people there, the activists, they're very open-minded, they're very liberal, even the people from all different school thoughts, even the Islamists from them. So when you talk about the fear of certain political party coming into power or another, another party, I don't think that's the case. Election will be the decision-making point. And trust me, the Syrian people know it, and they said it, they told me, if another, if hopefully this regime will fall, and if another regime comes, and it doesn't behave itself, mm. they will fall. We're not stopping. They've tasted freedom, and there's no going back. And I agree with you, we should think really. Those people are fighting with their very simple weapons, very simple weapons, against MiG-25, MiG-28, Sohoi, all these developed and technical weapons on the ground, tanks, um, T, all these new Russian tanks. So really we need to think how, how can we support them. Yes, I disagree with Western intervention, but if, my, if Western intervention is going to save my daughter's life, well let it be. This is how desperate they are. I think we need to change our way of thinking to humanitarian issues. We need to help the people there, maybe medically, food, shelter, and let them do their own work down there. Release their arms, release their arms from defending themselves. Is their right to defend themselves? Is their right? Self-defense is a human right. And I should wish we should support these human rights. <laughs> okay, I, I just wanted to start with, honestly, from a deep bottom of my heart, sympathies to the Syrian people. I, I, and it, I don't want to seem strange, but I understand exactly how you're going through. And, you know, uh, you know we lost a quarter of a million people in the Civil War in Lebanon, including large sections of my family. I've only just, this year, connected with some of my school friends who I left in the last war in 1975, who I actually I didn't know if they were alive or dead, and we, you know, Facebook bumped into each other. So I understand deeply how you feel. And I also know that in, I remember very, very clearly in 1975 when we were being mortared, never mind anything bigger, we, we were at the bottom of our building praying the French would come. Why the French? Why not? Who else is going to stop this? I mean, this is, this, this is the truth. And of course you feel that deep, 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 I understand that sense of desperation, that sense of being under siege, sense of hunger and all this kind of thing. You know, say, I just don't want to seem flippant when I'm saying I'm also extraordinarily optimistic. Because throughout the whole civil war, I used to, our house was near the front line, and I used to look across to the area known as Hamra, which is where all the nice food was. And I used to think one day I will cross this line. And near the end of the war, in the late 80s, I used to go every day as a symbolic gesture to the front line, to the green line, and ask the militiamen to allow me to pass. Every day was the other, you know, go home, shut up, what are you doing, you mad, you'll be shot and everything. But so that sense of which, suddenly when it went, suddenly when it changed, I crossed every day. Every time I go to Beirut, I crossed the, what is the old, called the old green line every day, because it's actually quite symbolic for me. And I, I do understand that. I do really understand that. And something from the else I have to say. Which is my grandmother, bless her heart, died this year. She was 106. Um, I was used to love her because I called her a Syrian, but she was born before Lebanon was separated from Syria. It was to scandalize my uncles because they're all big Lebanese nationalists. But, you know. Um, but what was what really interesting is that she would tell me about the famine, 1917. She was a very young girl, in which 
large, no, huge numbers of people died under the rule of the Turks in the middle of the Civil War, in the middle of the First World War. Absolutely horrible. And you, you hear about the descriptions of not simply cannibalism, but digging up the dead to eat the dead. This is how desperate it was. But I tell you, when the French came, and I said, she said, I remember everyone kissing their boots. Kissing the boots of the French because they brought with them food. Because it actually meant we weren't going to starve, we weren't going to die. But really, what the French occupation mean for Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine? And actually, so when we talk about, not simply talk about what we can do today and how horrible it is, and so on, but actually understand this, what does it mean for the next 40 years? Are we going to have to go through, not simply 30 or 40,000 dead, but of a quarter of a million, half a million? I think this is, this, the, the, this is the thing we, we are constantly faced with. I believe that um, any form of intervention in terms of Western military will actually mean them taking over our, our land again, and will actually mean, and I hate to go back to history, the division of Syria. Because the reason why Syria remains Syria and Lebanon, and Jordan, and Palestine, and that area in the north, Alexandretta, which is now southern Turkey, was ripped off from Syria, was because these were the only places in which the resistance failed. The place where the resistance didn't fail was in what we now call proper Syria. And what's really interesting is that this resistance against the French rule overcame sectarianism. Because you read about it at the time, they were trying to arm the Alawis against, uh, and the Druze, and these people and that people, using the Armenians and so on. This was the Syrian Revolution. We talk about the Syrian Revolution in 1926. We talk about the defeat of French imperialism. Actually, we talk about the reason why Syria is one country and not five. And actually, I quite like the day when the borders go completely. And we can, you know, during the, 19, the 2006 war, I was reporting from Damascus about the refugees from southern Lebanon. You know, it was a fantastic moment. It was when we crossed the border again, because no one checked my passport. And I thought, oh, this is, this is what it must have been like for my great-grandfather. There's Damascus. You just drive over. Why do you have to go through checkpoints and so on? So actually, it's about ensuring that we're not simply fighting for today, but actually we're fighting for the next four, 40 or 50 years as well. To we establish an independent, legitimate, free Syria, in which its responsibility comes from its people at the same time. And I'll say this, at the same time, I'm extraordinarily optimistic it's going to win. Because really, every day, this regime is take, being taken apart, piece by piece. You read about what's happening in Aleppo and, and other areas in Deir Ezzor and so on, you feel it's taken piece by piece. There was a... a, a, a and then I, I, I emailed the picture of Beirut, 1979, 1980, and now. And you see the state of Beirut then, and you see the state of Beirut now. It's been rebuilt. Of course you can rebuild. And it feels horrible. It will, be, it, will, it will be rebuilt. And I always laugh because, of course, the truth is about central Beirut is rebuilt by Syrian workers. And so I have no fear that they'll rebuild the country. Absolutely. Syria is very good for that. And so I, I think we have to be optimistic because otherwise we will just slip into despair. And that's the last thing, uh, the last thing we, 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 we want to do. What criticism do I have of the revolution? I mean, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there will be criticisms. I just can't think of any at the moment. Hurry up and win. I think it's probably my own. My, my only criticism: Don't give in to sectarianism. Don't allow, don't allow the horror of war to turn you into something you're not. Keep that central part of what the revolution is about, which is the Syrian people are one. It's about everyone together building a, a, a future for Syria. I think that's really important. And I think that any government that comes, and whatever government they choose really is, is up to the Syrian people, but that if that is not accountable, then it will fall. I think that's very, very important. I think this is something, you know, you read, you read about people say, oh, the Arab Spring is past, it's gone, etc., etc. but you know, they're terrified of the street. They're absolutely terrified of the Arab street now, and you see this, and you, and you see this everywhere. And I think it's really important that we keep the governments scared of the people. And I think this is, uh, this is uh, something you have to understand. The, the, the question just about Robert Fisk, to be honest with you, I thought Robert Fisher should have retired in 2005. I know he was going to retire in 2005. And then his friend, Rafiq Hariri, got killed and he was dragged back in. And there was that period, I think, after 2005, where Robert Fisch became massively anti Syrian regime. And our big fear at the time was you're you falling too much into what they call the March, March 14, the kind of sectarian or pro Western sectarian, not all sectarian, but pro, a pro Western formation in Lebanon. Um, why, why is he messing around with them? Does he understand, etc., etc.? And then suddenly, you know, I just feel that he's lost any kind of sense. And I, you know, I think we grew up on Robert Fisk. Lots of people read Robert Fisk, and that's really important. But that piece he did on, you know, embedding with the Syrian army and repeating the lies of the Syrian army and 
you know, Rolfus gets to interview prisoners in a Syrian jail. Who the hell gets to interview prisoners in a Syrian jail? No one gets to interview prisoners in a Syrian jail. And suddenly they're saying, and I'm just thinking, come on, Robert, you know. But, you know, the, 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 there you go. I think there's a lot of disappointment with, with him, but, but, but there you go. I think there's, there, there's a bigger thing that we have to look at, which is the question of imperialism. I think it's important we understand that imperialism in the Middle East is weaker than it's ever been in the last hundred years. And you know, people understand that what happened in Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, and what the invasion of Iraq meant for the U.S. It was an attempt to project U.S. power. In the end, it ended up projecting U.S. weakness, because they lost the war in Iraq. And whatever people say about the client regime and so on, it's not a client regime. Actually, the reason it's not a client regime is because they're allowing arms into the Syrian regime. You know, they're allowing the, the Iranians to, to fly their, 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 uh, comp, you know, their, their uh, uh, resupplies over Iraqi airspace. So it's not a client U.S. regime. It's actually, it showed the weakness, massive weakness inside of, of, of the U.S. And there's something much bigger going on, much, much bigger going on, which is you see in the decline of U.S. economic power and the rise of China. And uh, people, you know, talk about when, when, when Morsi went, where's the first place he went to when he became elected uh, president of Egypt? He went to China. Why? To secure, was it 12 billion investment? Where? In factories along the Suez Canal. How much do the Americans give? Three, four billion. Actually, it's shifted massively. We talk about the whole of them, at least you have to understand there is a weakening, a weakening, a weakening of US power. This means, in some senses, it's more dangerous because they rely on Israel much more than they did before. But in another sense, you see the jumpiness. Because when you see how Obama and Netanyahu are dealing with each other, you think this is not a nice relationship. Netanyahu is attacking Obama. Why? Because Obama doesn't want to give the green light to attack Iran. And you say, well, why? Does he, does he love Iran? No. Because he's terrified. And he says it. If you attack Iran, then we are in danger of losing the rest of the Arab world. This is the, the, the way you put it. You have to understand it's very, very weak. And so there is an attempt, if you like, to Western imperialism to ingratiate itself with uh, the Arab Revolution and so on. But actually, it's not like the 1950s. The 1950s, when there was an uprising in Lebanon, the Marines arrived on the beach. Quickly, I remember people, you know, my dad talking about it because they're all sunbathing. And the Marines arrived, and of course, the Lebanese started sending them folk and you know, various other things. And they can't do that anymore. <laughs> so we have to understand that the, the, we call the Iraq, what I will call the Iraq syndrome. You look at Afghanistan, big retreat. You look in Afghanistan, uh, in Iraq, big retreat. Actually, there's problems everywhere. And then you just think what's happened over the last two years. They lost Tunisia, but more importantly, they lost Egypt. They're also losing Yemen, but to lose Egypt, really, this is you know, more than reckless. Because the thing about Egypt is it's huge, extraordinarily powerful, and they're terrified of, and everyone's terrified of the Arab Street. I remember I was covering the Iraq war, not in Iraq, but from, 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 from outside. There was this very interesting debate inside of the US administration, the neocon administration, in which people kept warning Bush, be careful about invading Iraq because you might trigger the Arab Street, the Arab, what they call the Arab Street. And it was like, if they didn't rise over the invasion of Iraq, they'll never rise. And so there was this belief that the Arab people will never, ever rise. And it was, it was the thing, oh, they're never ready for democracy, they'll never do it, and so on. Suddenly, you have this huge wave of revolutions, and now they know that it can happen. And so they know, and, uh, and they actually know uh, the, 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 that it is there. There is something that's happened in the, in the Arab Spring, but the Arab revolutions it actually means that now people are terrified of what, of, of what takes place on the ground. Just a question of Hezbollah and in the south. I think it's really important, and Lebanon generally, because there is a massive split inside of Lebanon. And the split goes between the leadership and the people on the ground. And you see this most, it's most sharp, you see this in the Communist Party in the Bekaa Valley, which is overwhelmingly Shia and overwhelmingly pro-resistance, but only the leadership. Because you speak to the people on the ground, they are furious. And so you have, even with the Communist Party, the leadership of the Communist Party supporting the regime, and the people on the ground trying to find ways of supplying the revolution with guns. If you go into the Dahi, into the areas, you find, I, I, when, when I was there a, a, a while back talking to our, our, our Lebanese comrades, the vast, vast majority of them are Shia, and they talk about having to go, when the Syrian revolution first erupted, having to go to talk to people in the Dahi and say, whatever you do, do not come out on the streets against Hezbollah, this is too early, and so on, because that feeling of anger that was building up. And then you go to the south, and you see the petition signed by 100 families. Who are these Shia families in the South condemning Hassan Nasrallah for denouncing the revolution? Why? Because if you were Shia in the South, where did you stay? How did you survive in 2006? You were in Homs, you were in Damascus, or you were in uh, Italy, you know, in all these places. I think this, this sense of betrayal amongst the Syrians about what was taking place is very, very deep. 
but there's also a very deep sense of betrayal also inside of Lebanon, because there is, and you have, I mean, for, for me, I think the, the, the one that affects me more is something called the Free Patriotic Movement, which is mainly Christian, and a man called uh, Michel Aoun, who was a general in Lebanon in 1989, launched the War of Liberation against the Israelis, against the Israelis, against the Syrians. This is how our house got damaged. There was a huge war between Rome and the Syrians. Anti-Syrian, 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 anti-Syrian. Then he makes a deal with Hezbollah. Now, it's like Assad is our brother. Assad is like, for God's sake. But actually, that massive sentiment on the ground, understanding that this is real, is really, is also there. But there's fear. Of course there is. Because we, uh, Lebanon is ruled by a bunch of think Syrian gangsters about to meet the Lebanese ones. They're absolutely horrible, sectarian, nasty, vicious, and so on. And so, you know, we, we, we have a joke in Lebanon, you know, the Egyptians overthrow one regime, we have to overthrow 20. Because, you know, we have 20 different religious sects. And so to overthrow, everyone has to overthrow their own, uh, their own thing. But there is, at the same time, this sense of which something is going to come out of this. Something much better. Because there is a new world, and it is a, a changing. And we are in very dark days. And when you're in dark days, you feel like nothing can happen. But I think what we're seeing inside of Syria is that it can never return. If you want a massacre, it's when we stop. If it stops now, there will be a massacre. Actually, it has to keep going until the end. I think that's really, really, really important. But also, the foundations that are being laid for a future Syrian society. And the sentiment that has emerged out of this revolution, I think, is something that is so amazing and something that we should, uh, we should embrace. And finally, I, I know I'm going on too long, but I just want to finally say this in MENA. I'll tell you what it's like. Um, Middle East Solidarity, we, we put quite recently a, uh, 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 a resolution supporting, uh, supporting us. Uh, the MENA uh, campaign, to the National Union of Teachers. Inside of that was unconditional support for the Syrian revolution. There was not one voice that came out against it. Not one. Actually, all the pro-Syrian people that, that were there didn't say a bloody word. It was actually the overwhelming sentiment amongst ordinary people as we were with this. Even though they might understand or there might be confusion and so on, but actually that ordinary sentiment is we were with this. And I think that's something that is very, very important. And, the, and, and although it seems quite desperate today, Actually, these links that we make today is about the rebuilding the future of Syria and ensuring that. And I think, you know, in say against Western military intervention, that is troops and tanks and jets coming in. Frankly, if they want that, you know, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. If they want to supply the Free Syrian Army with anti-tank weapons, please go ahead. There's a fantastic picture of Hassan Nasrallah holding an M16. He's holding an M16. Where, where did they make this? And, hey, they made this in America. What's he holding an M16 for? Where did he get this from? Of course. It doesn't matter. It's not the weapon, it's what's in the mind of the person holding the weapon. So I am, actually, I, I don't care where they get the weapons from, if it stops the war. But what I'm against is the West using this as an opportunity to come back into that area, and come back to this area. This is uh, completely, uh, completely unacceptable. And very finally, uh, uh, just to say that the hope for the Syrian revolution, but also the hope for the Arab revolution is everywhere. Because we're going to face a whole series of problems coming up over and over and over again. This is going to keep coming up over and over again. But actually, give me this year. Give me these last two years and the last 30 years. And you often hear people say, but it's chaos now. But I'll tell you what, it was chaos before. It's just you can talk about it. People would disappear, you can talk about it. People would suffer constantly their humiliation, you weren't allowed to talk about it. Now we can talk about it. It's horrible, it's nasty, uh, and, and it feels like you'll never come out of it. But actually... We have to break this regime. And so breaking the regime also means that we open up a future. Because to return, to return to how it was before, I think is unacceptable on any terms. And so I'm always completely optimistic. I think optimism opens the door to infinite opportunity. Because we're optimistic, I think this means uh, that, we, uh, that, that, that we support Syrian revolution. We understand the depth and the despair many Syrians have. And understand uh, where that's coming from. And day to day, 100, 150, 200 people dying here is unacceptable. It's horrible, but the only way to stop it is to finally get rid of this regime, and I believe certain people will do it now. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank both our speakers, but actually I want to thank everybody that's come and contributed to the discussion. Hopefully we're all more educated about the topic of Syria and what's happening. Uh, and like we said, this is the start of what we want to do. We want to build the links today and take them forward. This, you know, what happened in Syria won't be over in the next few weeks. You know, it would be wonderful if the revolution could be won in the next few weeks, but I don't think it will. And I think for us today, it's about the networks that we build and we continue to be ready to support in any way we can what's happening in Syria. And on that note, we have, I have a couple of leaflets here that men have produced around the work that they've already done. And hopefully it gives people an idea of what we can do. 
and how we can help around the Syrian question. Uh, I mean, I did ask uh, Simon whether he did have leaflets about Syrian, and his response was that we had produced leaflets and they're out of date as fast as they, they didn't you know, produce them. So, because there's so much is happening on the ground, that, I mean, that literally is it. There's so much happening, things are changing so constantly uh, that it is a struggle to keep up to date. But we do have a website, and people can email in you know, reports of what is happening that we can update instantly. There's a lot easier to update through a website, through emails, than it is through printed uh, leaflets. Uh, and on that note, I did, like I said, I want to thank everybody, but also um, both uh, the Syrian organisation that have helped organise today's event and RAPAR, we, don't, uh, we are not funded by great organisations. We, we do not have the media or the Western powers supporting what we do. We are funded by the volunteers in this room. We are funded by people like yourselves that support what we do and support the work uh, and keep us going. So on that note, I usually hate talking about money, but I am going to have to ask for a collection. And the reason we like to have a collection is because we do need to pay for Simon's transport. Uh, so I'm going to, if we can actually pass a cup round or something, and if people could put something in, that would be great, because it would be great to be able to pay Simon's bills. And hopefully we continue doing the work that we're doing. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Um, um, we'll meet again, hopefully, no doubt. Okay.